Thank you, Darrell. And thank you to the Manzanar Pilgrimage Committee for the work that you've done this year in putting together this pilgrimage, but also for the work that you've done over the last 43 years in putting the pilgrimage together. And as we all gather around here today, we realize that there are a number of people, including Sue Embry, who are not with us, and we remember them be with our presence here today. And to everyone who's here, everyone who's traveled distances to come here, thank you for being here today. And thank you for sharing in this moment, and thank you for remembering a very important time in our nation and in our community's history. I'd like to start off by telling you about what happened to me this morning before I left Los Angeles to come here. This morning, I went to my father's home. And a bit about my father, he's 86 years old, and he suffered a stroke a few months ago. And this morning, like with many other mornings, I went to his bedside and helped him get from his bed to his wheelchair. And then from the wheelchair, I pushed him to the bathroom, and then I was able to help him change his clothes. And as I gently moved every leg, and as I gently moved his arms to put on the clothes of the day, and as I carefully put each foot into his shoe, I was overcome by a mixture of emotions. Sadness for the challenges that my once strong father was now facing at this point in his life. A sense of duty and obligation to continue to help to care for him. And love, love for the man who had helped me to become the man that I am today. And as I was driving up here to Manzanar, my mind was flooded with a host of memories. Memories of days when he could run faster than me. Memories of days when he could throw a ball farther than I could. And his favorite memory of all, the fact that I was never able to beat him in a round of golf. <laughs> but there were also dark memories that found their way into my mind. Memories of days when we argued and fought. Mem memories of days when we didn't see eye to eye. And memories of days when we ignored each other. And as much as I wanted those memories to go away, as much as I wanted them to be out of my mind, I realized that I could not push them out of my mind, and I could not push them out of my thoughts. And I realized that the relationship that my father and I have, the love that I have for the man that I call dad, is forged not only from good memories, but from dark memories and powerful memories of days that we had to work through. And so it was important for me in that moment to know that I needed to embrace both the good and the bad memories of my father because they defined who I am as a human being. Today, we have all traveled great distances to be here in this spot, to be in a place where 70 years ago, our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers, our mothers, our grandmothers, and our great-grandmothers were forced to come. We chose to come here today willingly. Why? Why did we all come? Why did we come to a place that other people want to forget. Just like the memories of my father define me, the memories of this place, of Manzanar, <laughs> define everyone who is here today. If you lived here in World War II, behind barbed wire, then this place certainly defines who you are. If you are of that generation that never tasted mess hall food and never had a gun tower faced at you, but you lived with people who had that dark place in their soul because of the incarceration, whether it was here or any of the other concentration camps, this place defines you. If you are a member of a group who faces hatred, injustice, and unfairness simply because of the color of your skin, the country of your origin, the God that you worship, or the person whom you choose to love, 
the essence of this place defines you. And if you are a person who loves the concept of freedom and equality and know just how elusive those concepts are, then you are defined by this place and by all the other concentration camps that happened during World War II. But it's important for us to remember as we stand here today that the concentration camp story does not end with the closure of the camps. That there was a whole second chapter to that story. The chapter of redress and the chapter of how a small disenfranchised community that was hated and despised by the rest of the country was able to find its voice and stand up to the nation and say, justice delayed is justice denied. We are owed an apology. The concentration camp story of World War II is not just a great Japanese American story. It is a great American story. It is a story of how our community found its voice and went from saying shikata ganai to justice delayed is justice denied. Come back with me, if you will, to spring 1942 in the middle of the block on Wood Street in West Oakland as a young African-American boy, seven years of age, watches in horror as the six-by trucks come to pick up his best friend, a Japanese-American young boy named Roland. In the words of that young boy, now a man, I will never forget, never forget, the vision of fear in the eyes of my friend Roland and the pain of leaving home. My mother, bright as she was, try as she may, could not explain to me why they were, ch they were taking my friend as he screamed not to go. That young African-American boy, his name was Ron Dellums, and he grew up to be a member of Congress. And on September 17, 1987, delivered an impassioned plea on the floor of the House of Representatives for the passage of the redress legislation. Come back with me, if you will, to spring 1942, as a young 17-year-old Mexican-American young man watches the families of his Japanese-American friends selling all of their belongings because they are about to be shipped off to a place called Manzanar. He looked at that and he un didn't understand. And he said, these people hadn't done anything I hadn't done except go to Japanese language school. And at 17 years of age, this young Mexican-American young man made a principled decision to go with his friends. He goes to the train station, slips on board, and eventually lands up here at Manzanar, where he was a camp inspiration, where he became class president of the Manzanar High School and graduated before he went off to serve in the U.S. Army. That young Mexican-American young man's name was Ralph Lazo. And during the redress movement, Mr. Lazo spoke often about the need for redress, not because of what he did, but because he wanted the injustice to be corrected. Come back with me, if you will, to late 1944, as a young white American Air Force pilot returns home after flying combat missions in the Pacific against the armed forces of Japan. He sits at his dining room table and reads about the Supreme Court decisions on Korematsu, Hirabayashi, and Yasui. And he says to himself, this is wrong. They corralled those Japanese Americans up and sent them like cattle. And he makes a vow to himself that if he could ever right this grave wrong, he would do so. That young white American fighter pilot's name was Jim Wright. And he would go on to become the Speaker of the House and was very supportive of the redress legislation. Come back with me to Italy, 1943. As a young Japanese American who's a sergeant in the US Army is interviewed by a reporter who asks him, why are you doing this? Why are you 
fighting for your country, putting yourself in harm's way, and possibly being killed while your family is back in the States behind barbed wire, being denied their civil liberties. That young sergeant responded in a way that many of the Nisei soldiers of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team would have responded and said, because this is the only way that I know that my family can have a better chance or any chance in America. That young sergeant's name was Kazuo Masuda and his words were more prophetic than he would ever know. And finally come back with me to springtime 1942 as a young Japanese American boy, 10 years of age, dressed in his Cub Scout uniform, stands with his family waiting to board a train to take them to who knows where for who knows how long and they knew not what was going to happen to them. That young boy stood there nervously holding his baseball glove and his baseball bat and as he attempted to load the train an armed sentry came up to him and removed the bat and said to him you can't take that because that's a lethal weapon. That young boy and his family would spend the next three years of their life in an American concentration camp. And after the camps were closed, as they were headed home to their home in San Jose, they stopped at a diner, ordered a meal, and upon completing the meal, that young boy, now 13 years old, stands up and begins stacking the dishes and clearing the table as he did for three years in the mess halls in the concentration camp where he and his family were. His mother looks at him and gently says to him, Norman, we don't need to do that anymore. We're free now. That young boy's name was Norm Mineta. Yes, let's clap for Norm Mineta. And as you know, he was an undying advocate for the redress legislation. And he was the first American congressman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives who was a former inmate of an American concentration camp. Why do I share these stories with you? I share these stories as evidence that what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II did not only affect Japanese Americans, but affected Americans of all backgrounds who cared about justice, who cared about liberty who cared about making America the place that it is promised to be. The redress movement took many decades, and it started in places like this in 1969 when we had the first Manson Art pilgrimage. And in order to set up that pilgrimage, two men came out here earlier, Warren Furutani and the late Victor Shibata. And the story that Warren tells is that they came out in order to look at the place, to figure out how they were going to have this pilgrimage and to scope out what they would do where and how. And as they were looking over the landscape, as Warren puts it, this white pickup truck comes driving up to them. And in Warren's words, it looks like a, a typical redneck staring at him. And if you know Warren, that's not something you want to do. The guy comes driving up to him, leans out his door, and says to, uh, to Victor and to Warren, what you boys doing? Now again, the second thing you don't want to do to Warren Furutani after you stared at him is call him a boy. <laughs> Warren dons his best militant and activist style and goes up to the man and says, we are here to commemorate what happened to Japanese Americans in World War II. You know Warren, he opens his mouth and silver dollars roll out. <laughs> well, as he's telling the man what he's doing here, the man starts to laugh at him. Now that's strike number three. You don't stare at Warren, you don't call him a boy, and you certainly don't laugh in his face. But before Warren can jump down his throat, the man says to Warren and to Victor, well, if you boys are here from Manzanar, you're on the wrong side of the road. It's over there. <laughs> War, in 1969, we as a community had much to learn about our own history and had much to learn about how to commemorate it and to fight for what was right. In the 70s, our community was still divided and still needed to find that common ground of what we would be fighting for. Some people in the community said, let it go. We don't want to remember. We don't want to have to relive the past. We don't want to have to feel the pain once again. A second group said, no, we were wrong and we are deserving of an apology, a good, clean apology. 
And there was a very practical side to that argument because we didn't think, those in that camp, that getting redress payments, monetary redress payments, were even possible. But there was also a very principled side. And the principle was this. Don't insult us. Don't put a price tag on our civil liberties. Take them away and say you can throw a few dollars at us and all is forgiven and all is well. Don't take us to that place. Just give us a good, clean apology. And finally, the third group that eventually won out said, no, what was done to us is wrong. We are deserving of an apology. And let's be truthful, folks. It wasn't that our feelings were hurt. There were real true losses. People lost their homes. People lost their jobs. People lost their opportunities. People lost their neighborhoods. And people lost their sense of place at the American table of citizenship. We were deserving of an apology, and we were deserving of an apology that came with money. And eventually the community said, yes, that's what we're willing to fight for. In the early 80s, for those of us who were, can remember, there were the commission hearings in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in New York, in Chicago, across the nation. Japanese Americans told their story before a blue ribbon commission of the federal government. Stories that for some they had never told in public. Feelings and emotions poured out at those hearings that had never been shared before. I was a young college student at that time and I remember in Los Angeles there was a man who testified. His name was Kiyoshi Sonoda. And Dr. Sonoda was a dentist. And he testified that because he had some medical training, he was put in the infirmary. And he de described his first patient, a young, dehydrated infant. And Dr. Sonoda said that under normal circumstances, he would have been able to treat that child if he had had the proper supplies to treat that child and make it well. But because he didn't have the proper supplies, all he could do was hold that child in his hands and feel its last twitch before he died. And as he told this story, Dr. Sonoda had tears streaming down his face. And in the audience, his wife was sitting there and said, Kiyoshi is crying. Kiyoshi doesn't cry. Kiyoshi didn't even cry at his own father's funeral. But on that day, Dr. Sonoda did cry. And a community cried with him. Because our story was being told and our pain was being shared. And the community knew that we needed to fight for redress. In the mid-80s, in the 98th, in the 99th, and the 100th Congress, the community, led by student activists, led by community members, led by the congressional delegation in Washington, D.C., fought in the halls of Congress to get the bill passed. And in September of 1987, the House passed the bill giving uh, legislative redress to Japanese Americans. In April of 1988, the Senate passed the bill. So all that was left was to get the signature of one last person, the President. And for those of you who remember, the President in 1988 was Ronald Reagan. And for those of you who remember Ronald Reagan, we knew that Ronald Reagan and his administration had been no friend to redress. They had fought against redress in the courts as well as in the Congress. So the question was, how do we get the president to sign this bill after he had worked so hard not to support it in the years past? Well, for those of you who remember Ronald Reagan, whether you supported his policies or not, and I would guess in this audience it's not, <laughs> the one thing you can say about him is that he was a great communicator. He would be able to speak to people and tell stories that would touch their hearts. But the opposite was true of Ronald Reagan also. If you could tell him a story that would move him and touch his heart, you could have a great advocate on, his hand, on your hands. So the question was, what story would we be able to tell Ronald Reagan that would move his heart? Well, you rem remember I mentioned a few minutes ago Sergeant Kazuo Masuda who said that he was fighting because that was the only way he knew that his family had a chance in America. Two weeks after giving that interview, Sergeant Masuda was killed in battle 
in Italy, fighting for his country, the United States of America. After the war, his family wanted to bury him, bury their son in the local uh, cemetery in Santa Ana. But the local community said, no, we want no Jap body in our cemetery. Never mind that he was an American citizen. We want no Jap body in our cemetery. Never mind that he was a decorated war veteran who died fighting for his country, the United States of America. No Jap body. The army, realizing that this was a PR fiasco, and, Gen uh, and General Vinegar Joe Stilwell realizing that the men who he knew fought so bravely were being disrespected, set up a medal ceremony for the family of Kazuo Masuda. And on that day, there was a young white American captain named Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan read these words to the family of Kazuo Masuda. The blood that is soaked into the sands is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on an ideal. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, as one member of the American family to another, for what your son Coswell did, thanks. We were able to relay that story back to the president. And in fact, our honoree here today, Rose Ochi, was credited by President Reagan in the, at the signing ceremony for having brought that story back to his attention. And when he received that story, he simply said, I remember that day, and I remember what the soldiers did for our country. On August 10, 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, granting redress and monetary payments to all the living Japanese Americans who were alive on that day. It was a great and wonderful day, not only for our community, not only for all those who helped fight for that bit of justice, but for our nation. But today, today we come together. Why? To remember and to pledge that we will remember the lessons of the redress movement. Because unless we remember the lessons of the redress movement, those lessons are meaningless. Justice is not a permanent thing. Justice is something that we must continue to fight for. And, and redress is not over. A few examples are that the Japanese Latin Americans were never fully recognized for the tra tragedies that they had to face and for the travesties of justice that were perpetrated upon them. Today, we have members of groups because of the color of their skin, because of the country of their origin, because of the God they worship, because of the person they choose to love, who are discriminated against and treated differently in this country. We all here today must pledge to ourselves and to our nation that we will remember the lessons of the Japanese American incarceration and the fight for justice and take those lessons and apply them to others who need them today. As I think of my father, and I think of the lessons he shared with me, I think of Okage Samade. Because of him, I am. Because of him, I must be the father to my children that he was to me. As we think of the Issei and the Nisei, the Sansei and the Yonsei that have gone before us, those that lived in concentration camps like this, those that died on the battlefields in Europe, those who fought for justice after the camps were closed, we must remember their lessons and know that Okage Samade, because of them, we are. And to the Issei and the Nisei who were here at Manzanar, we pledge that we will remember and we will never forget. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So. I got a little dyslexic and uh, got off our program here. We're going to have some musical interlude entertainment, and we're going to have two musical pieces in one segment. Mary Kageyama Nomura, ladies and gentlemen, is well known as the songbird of Manzanar. Mary came here when she was a 14-year-old gal. 16? Okay. Well... Uh, Close Mary. Enough. 
I'm not even sure what you're going to sing for us today. Something real old. Something real old? Something kind oh, of swingy? No. Yeah, swingy, jazzy. What's your favorite kind of music, Mary? Swing music, maybe? Swing, yeah. And, and you um, had a famous teacher here. Louis Frizzell. Louis Frizzell. My mentor. Who actually appeared as an actor in... Farewell to Manzanar. Farewell to Manzanar. How many of you young people here, or older people, read that book, Farewell to Manzanar? It's an amazing book. We hope to get Gene Wakatsky Houston back here someday. Mary. Yes. It is up to you. Here we go. Yoshi, please. I can't give you anything but love. I can't give you anything but love, baby. That's the only thing I've plenty of, baby. Dream a while, scheme a while, you're sure to find happiness. And I guess all those things you've always longed for. Gee, I'd like to see ya look and swell, baby. Diamond cufflinks, Target doesn't sell, my pretty baby. Till that lucky day, you know darn well. I can't give you anything but love. The musical accompaniment is by my nephew, Mr. David Iwataki. This song is so old, I think it was made up composed before I was born. Uh, uh, 